All right, so I'm picking this up on, I think it's page 134. And it's, it's funny, I was thinking about this during the break. It may seem at times we're going fast in here, and it may seem at times we're going slow in here. But hopefully it kind of evens out. What I'd like to do, this is going to sound a little different, but um, you're supposed to have a test next Monday. I'm not sure it'll either be Monday or Tuesday. I'm not worried about that one way or the other. But I'd like to go today over Chapter 4 and Chapter 5. Tomorrow, i like to go over Chapter 6 and Chapter 7. Friday, i like to go over Chapter 8. But we have to start doing stuff. We have to start implementing. I don't want it just where Jeff talks. But the material that you have between 1 and 8 are the first two tests. Now, the way that they've rewritten this test it's expecting that either you're going to be using advanced CSS topics that are later in the book or that we're using a package that's called Bootstrap that I'm, I wasn't going to teach you until the end of the semester. All right. So I'm not sure, but we're going to work that in one way or the other. The bottom line is this. By the end of this week, we will have created a website as a class that will be similar in nature to what your test will be on, all right? And I will give you, we'll call it a pretest. So we'll see how the timing works because I'd rather have you build two of them yourselves and give you the test on Tuesday than slamming this stuff into you and having you do it on Monday and having some of you struggle like crazy with it. The more practice you get, the easier it's gonna be for you to do. It's like anything else, except playing guitar. All right, so, now we're going to talk about selectors, all right? And as you go in here, this is where I told you, it's not going to make a lot of sense to sit there and say, oh, I'm going to memorize this stuff. You know, again, half the battle is knowing where to look for things, all right? Okay, so it says HTML that can be selected by a type, by an ID, or a class. Okay, that's all fine and dandy. Point is this, you already know type. First of all, you know the asterisk. I showed you that today. That's what's called the universal selector. All right. Now, let's let's go in. You don't have to follow me doing this, but I'm just going to try to make it hopefully a little easier for you. I'm going to come in and add another page to this very simple site that we've been working with. Okay, so I want to put it where? I want to put it in here. So I'm going to say new file and for some reason it didn't like what I did, so let me try it again. Okay, let's go back to Explorer. Come on, go back up. Images website, there we go. Website 02. I think I've got more than one thing open in here, and that's what's screwing stuff up. In fact, let's do this because I think it'll make it a lot easier. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to create a new folder that's just called CSS stuff. All right. And it'll have more in, the, in there than just CSS, but that's fine. So I've done this before for you. I'm going to do it like this. So I'm going to come in here and do a new folder with CSS in it. I'm going to come in there and I'm going to create a new text document that'll be styles.css. Yes, I want to change it. And I will come in here and create a new text document, which is my index.html. All right, yes, I want to change it. And then I'm going to come in and open this in another code. So I've, I've got two codes open, and that's totally fine. So you can see what's in here right now. All right, with my index file, I'm just going to start it the way we've been starting it, so it's like this. Okay. I'm not going to worry about changing the title. We talked about all that stuff. That's not what's important. All right. But I want to lay out or start laying out you know, stuff that we'd want on a page. So I'm just going to put in here an H1 tag. Not there. All right. There we go. So I'm going to put in an H1 tag here. Website. All right. Then underneath that, I'm going to put in, I'm just going to, I'm going to put in a paragraph 
and I'm going to put in some lorem 50. And I'm just going to copy that paragraph down a few times. I just want some stuff in here is what I'm saying. All right, I'm going to save this and take a quick look at it in live server. It's not going to look like much, and that's totally fine. So there it is. And again, it's bigger because I've got my browser size there. I'll leave it at about 200%. All right, so you already know a lot of this. So I'm going to come in here and in my styles file, you know as well as I do that, if, for example, if I come in and I say I want, all, I want to grab all paragraphs, and I want the color on those to be blue. So that'll be the text color. And let's just say we also want a background color on those, and we'll say gray. All right. You know now that once I do that and I come back and look in here again, thought I'd saved. Well, I'll double check. File. Oh, I didn't add my link to it. So save. Now when I come in here and I put in my link, which I should have done. So when I and I say link, and I say here CSS slash styles dot CSS, and I save, that's pretty obvious, right? Don't worry about the colors. That doesn't matter at all. But a lot of times what's going to happen is I don't want every one of these paragraphs to be that color. I only want some of them to be that color, all right? The way that it is set up right now, oops. The way that it is set up right now, every paragraph is going to be that color because that's what I've told it to do. All right. But how can I change that? Well, let's just say the only one I want to be that color is the first paragraph. All right. Just that one. Then I'm going to give this what's called an ID. Now, a bad name for this is first paragraph because I might change it, put a different one in there later. Another bad name for this is blue text with a gray background, because I might change that later. Some people will like, for, for instance, if we wanted to make this bigger, we'll call it big text. That's not a good name. All right. So I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to give it a name and I'm just going to call it, it's not a great name, but I'm going to call it custom para for a customized paragraph. Does that make sense? So that's the only one. And so I'm going to leave that right there. Then I'm going to come in here. And now nothing will, will look any different. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is these are bad colors together. I think you already saw that. So let's just reverse this. Let's make the text color white. And let's make the background color black. In fact, let's, let's use our color combinations that we were just looking at. FFF and 000. So it's just going to be reversed from the way it normally is. All right. Now, if I do it like this, it'll work. There's not a problem with it. You can see how it's changed. But I only want to change that first paragraph. Well, I've given that first paragraph a unique name of custom para. So when I want to show something has got a unique name, and that's an ID identifier, you have to preface it in here with a pound sign, hash sign, whatever you want to call it. So I say pound sign, custom para. Now, when I save and you look, it's only the first paragraph that's changed. Does that make sense to everybody? There should, on this page, only be one ID that's called custom para. There should only be one of those. Now, some people will put IDs in more than one place, and it may work. And then it may work, and then someday it may stop working. It's just that's just the way it is. Now let's assume for a second that this up here, and so I'm going to make a couple of them. So I'm going to say this. I'm going to make an H2 tag in just a minute, and so we want this, the H2 tag, and this to all be a different color. Okay, and I'm just using colors because you get immediate feedback when you look at it. All right. All right, so I'm going to come in here, and I'm again, I'm maybe not a great name, but I'm just going to call it custom color. So I'm going to come in here, and under my H1 tag, I'm going to make an H2 tag, and, you know, whatever. It doesn't really matter. The, the, the wordage in here doesn't matter. But I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to say the class is equal to custom color. 
And then I'm also going to do the same exact thing with the H2 tag and with my bottom paragraph. And if I go look at it now, absolutely nothing will have changed because I haven't made any changes in my CSS for custom color. I'm going to do that right now. All right. So I'm going to save this. Now I'm going to go over here. Now you use a hashtag in your CSS file. You use a hashtag if it's an ID. If it's a class, you use a period. So we wanted custom color. So we'll say period, custom color. All right. And we'll make it so you can, it really stands out. So again, we'll have the color. We'll have it green, which is what? Pound, uh, red, green, blue, zero, zero, F, F, zero, zero. All right. It's going to be pretty ugly, but that's okay. And the background. Well, I don't know what gold is, so I'm just going to use gold. All right. So I've done that, and I look at it again so you can see what's changed. All right. Don't Again, don't let the ugliness of this affect you. That doesn't mean anything. What I'm trying to do is show you the difference between using an ID, which is unique on a page. But I can have IDs for everything on the page. All right. And it's going to get more complex than that. Because when we, when we work, we get into the JavaScript part of the class. Then we're going to use something. So, for instance, let's say with that thing in here, what did we make? We call that like custom para or something like that. So, if you've got something with an ID that's equal to this, so if I set an ID equal to that, once we get into JavaScript, we're going to use something. And don't let it throw you if you don't get it. But we're going to say something like document dot get element by id and guess what name we're going to put in there custom para because then we're going to be able to go in and play with that programmatically using javascript we're going to use something that's called the document object model or the dom all right the other thing is when you when you give things this will make more sense when we talk about forms. When you give them an ID, you can also give them a name. You can say ID equals and name equals, and they're almost always the same thing. Now, the I, when you say ID equals, that's this class. It's server, I'm sorry, it's client side programming. The class that people take in the third semester, they use that name property. That's server side programming. All right. So jumping back into the book then, and that's what I'm going to be doing is just jumping back and forth between this stuff. All right. So I showed you very simply, I showed you setting up an ID and I showed you setting up classes. And again, they mentioned that in here. I'm not going to sit and read it to you. All right. When you work with just this, these are type selectors in here. These are ID selectors. These are class selectors. Does that make sense? Now, I'm not trying to confuse anyone, but just so you know, you can take the same element, you can take the same element and give it both a class and an ID. Not only that, you can take the same element and give it multiple classes. All right. I don't think you can give it multiple IDs. I've never tried. I don't know why you would do something like that. But first thing they're going to talk about in here are relational selectors. So let's just take a look at the examples. All right. So what does this say? This says this, these are all LIs. Remember those list items? But they must be inside of main. These are all anchor tags, but they must be inside of an unordered list. Now, why does that even matter? I want to show you actually why it does matter. Okay, this was, of course, I don't have the one up there anymore, but that's okay. Let me go and bring that up. There it is. No. Okay, this was the website. I don't think there was a, the website that we had been using. Okay. And if you look, if, if you remember, I'm going to go to the contact page here and just bring it up in live server. 
Remember when we went in and we changed these to stars? What if I don't want those to change? All right. So I could have said rather than changing all OLs, just change the OL, just certain ones. All right. And if you say, I don't get it. Well, that's what, like I said, that's what this chapter is about. So these are descendants. So the LI is a descendant of Maine. The anchor tag is a descendant of unordered list. All right. These are adjacent siblings. So they're adjacent to one another. All right. These are childs, child siblings. So this is just a direct child of this. What's the difference between this one like and this one? Like these look almost the same. These are direct child, direct children, not grandchildren, not great grandchildren as you work your way down. All right. And these are general. So notice the symbols, a plus sign, a greater than sign, and a tilde. Then the tilde is way up underneath your escape key at the top of your screen or the top of your keyboard. All right. I will tell you that most people that I know who work in this field try to use these as little as possible because they're confusing. And there's ways around doing them. If you're going to use one, you're going to use the descendant a lot. The other ones, as you need to. All right? So as it says, I'm just going to repeat the ones that are in here. For the descendant, it's when you want to select elements only that are descendants of a higher level element. All right? For the sibling, it's got to be adjacent to another element. Now, if you say, you went through this, I listened, I looked at what's in the book, and I'm still really confused, then I'd recommend you go out to W3 schools and look at their CSS tutorial, because they will give you examples that they want you to play with. All right? And that's, how, that's the best way of learning. All right? The child selector, as it says, Elements only when they are child, a child of a parent, and the sibling only when they're siblings to another element. It gets, I mean, this is where this gets fairly complex. All right. Let's make it worse. You can combine these and use what are called combinators. All right. Now, let's talk about what this means. Okay, this is why you don't have to necessarily use a lot of the tildes and the plus signs, etc. I want to go over what these mean here. This means all H1s and all H2s and all H3s. So if, if you're going to do the same thing for all three of them, there is no sense in putting H1 color blue, H2 color blue, H3 color blue. Now, if they're going to be different, then you would have to do that. All right. This one says an unordered list, but the unordered list has to have a class of speakers. What, what, what does that mean? That means when I put that UL tag in there, I say class equals speakers. Then anything that's in there is going to be affected by that CSS. All right. And it's going to get worse, just, just so you know, because what we're going to do is we're going to start making a nice menu for our website. And then when you get some of the stuff you have to do, it's, it's a little hinky when you do it once or twice, but then it's like, oh, that makes sort of makes sense. And you just do it. All right. So here are, these are all paragraphs and, and all the LIs that are in a UL with a class of speakers. So this can be as complex or as simplistic as you need it to be. This is any href. What do we typically use hrefs for? Two things. All right, we use it, you know, href for when we are saying where our CSS file lives, but mainly we use hrefs when we're going to be putting a link element in, you know, an anchor tag. All right, this is all inputs, but inputs that are of type submit. If you say, I don't know what that is, that's chapter 11. They're just showing it to you right here. There's other inputs you can use other than type equals submit. All right. So they explain that probably much better than I just did in there. Now, then we get these pseudo classes. If you don't know it, pseudo means false. All right. Now, 
It's a little bit confusing. The first thing I want to show you is what's on top here. And I think they put it in the right order. These are for your hyperlinks. Would everybody agree that by default, if unless you change it, unless told otherwise, when you make a hyper hyperlink, it's blue and it's underlined. And when you click on it, it becomes purple and underlined. All right. Link is one that hasn't been visited. That's the blue by default. All right. If you don't want it to have that, all right, you just basically, you just change the color. That's all you have to do. All right. Visited means you have clicked it. Again, that's the purple by default. Active is when you push down on the mouse button. You can make it change color. You haven't let go yet, but you push down on it. Hover is just that. You hover over something. All right. And a lot of times what you'll do is let's say that I've got a menu. And let's say that in my header, that's where my menu is. And it's black and all of the uh, stuff that's, you know, all of the text that's in there for the menu items is white. I might set it up so that when I hover over an item, it changes maybe to green or to gold or to something else. All right. Then there's focus. And when something has the focus, that's where the mouse is. All right. Now, make it even harder. There's some other ones in here. There's first child, last child, and only child. Who, who the heck? What? Well, what if I've got a link list? I'm not in my link list. What if I have an unordered list and I only want to do something special to the first item that's in that list? That's it. Maybe I want it bigger. Maybe I want it a different color, whatever. I can use the first child with it. Last child if I wanted to do something to the end one. All right. Only child if there's just one. To make it even harder than that, there's also something called nth child, where instead of nth, you put a number in there. And to make it even harder, you guys heard this last semester, we're computer people. The old joke is ask a computer person to count to 10, and they say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, because computers start at 0. Unfortunately, with a lot of this stuff that you use with CSS, some starts with 0 and some starts with 1. I don't know why they weren't universal, but they weren't, all right? You remember when we did that first letter thing, and I, I showed you this is another way we could have done it, all right? First line, you may or may not have noticed this, but in a lot of websites, when they have their stuff at the beginning of the site, right after their big tag, their first line of text oftentimes is in uppercase letters, all of it. You just don't realize it until you really look at it, and take a look at it. We could do that with first line. There's uh, all sorts of uses for this stuff. All right. So notice what they've done here. A link, color green. So it's green by default. A hover, fuchsia. So you've got your, they, they put the mouse over it. You can even change this pointer right here. The pointer usually looks kind of like an arrow. You can make it look like a finger like this. All right. Years ago, I created a, a site for people, and it was on the St. Louis Blues. It was a couple years ago, you know, when they when they won the title, and I tried to make the cursor look like a hockey puck, and I found it. But guess what? It just looked like a circle. Didn't really look like a hockey puck. All right. So, what's important in here is to take a quick look at this, but also, and I I don't want to I want to give it its due diligence. Notice where it says accessibility guidelines. Because again, we talked about accessibility, we started to, and this is where the extra stuff for accessibility is gonna come in. Now notice these are guidelines. There are some regulations for accessibility on certain types of sites. But if I'm, if I, again, if I'm just creating a site and I'm selling a service, but I'm a private company, there's nothing that says I have to make my site accessible to anybody. Or I can make it inaccessible to some people, I just won't get their business. But if I want it to be accessible to everybody, these are the kind of tips that you should follow. So, as it says here, apply the same formatting to hover and focus. That way, there are people who can, are, are very mouse deficient. There really are. There are people who use a trackball. I'll always remember this. You might laugh. I, it wasn't funny. I came in to work one night when I was teaching in Wisconsin, and there's a there's a guy. 
in there and he's, he's, he's in the back of the computer and he's yanking stuff off, not unscrewing it, he's yanking stuff off. And he said, I said, what's the problem? And he said, these mice don't work. They were trackballs. All right. And he didn't know that. He didn't know what a trackball was. He didn't know how to use a trackball. And evidently, he never heard of a screwdriver. So I went upstairs to the night supervisor and I said, you better get this clown out of here right now because he's destroying the lab. We had one lab. All right. He actually destroyed two of the trackballs that were in there. He did not even teach the whole night. All right. So the rules, we've already talked about these, how these rules work. And let's, let's make it even a little harder. There's something called exclamation point important. Okay. And this says, I don't care how the hell you've got something set, override it and use this. This overrides everything. What's the problem with that? I've looked at websites already where they've got exclamation sign important all over the place. It's something that should be used, but not overused and not abused. So you should have a really good reason for using it, is what I'm saying. All right. And we got normal declarations, the defaults, etc. All right. If more than one style rule is applied, you use the one with the highest specificity. What does that mean? That means you do IDs before you do classes. Because IDs are more specific, classes are more general. All right. And they tell you an ID and a class, and then if you just did all elements, etc. So you notice that when we did go in here and we did this, this custom para, all right, if I did come in here and do this, and I said all paragraphs, I don't know, I'm just going to make up this color, blue, background, background color, pink. All right, and we took a look at it. The only one that changed was the one that was not affected by other rules. All right. Okay, I think that's enough of this for now, this stuff. How to use the developer tools. Okay, I'd like all of you to at least try this, okay, and take a look at it. Because this is something that you're probably going to end up using sooner and not later. So you can bring up any, you know, you bring up the sheet we created as a class. It doesn't matter. I'm going to bring up this one because this is the one we've been working with, okay? And I'm on the contact page. I can go back to the home page. It doesn't matter. But find a blank space on the page, right mouse click, go down to the very bottom and choose inspect. So right mouse click, it's got to be on a running HTML page. I mean, you even could do this, you could bring up CNN.com or Google.com and do that. All right, and then go to inspect. This is the inspector right here. No, not Joy. I mean, this is the inspector right on your screen right here. All right, and it's got a lot of different things in it, such as, well, when we get to JavaScript, We'll go to the console. Don't worry about that. That's errors. Don't even worry about that stuff. All right. In fact, they're warnings anyway. There are, there's an elements thing that's in here, and it'll show us how the whole page is set up. See that? And I can break that up any way I want to. Network, we may or may not take a look at, but we do look at this in the advanced class. Because if you want to see how something is being loaded, if something is returning the correct value, et cetera. All right. So, but in elements, I'm going to come down here. I'm going to make this part of it a little bigger. And I'm going to go down to where it says, you see where it says styles? These are all the styles that we've applied. See that? So you can actually go in and click on it and change it. So if I didn't want the background to be green, for example, I can change it to something else. It's not going to permanently change it. It's going to change the copy that I have showing on the screen right now. I can go to compute it. In the next chapter, we're going to talk about what's called the CSS box model. And that's the box model right here. That's your content, followed by your padding, followed by your border, followed by your margin. And it even shows you 
how big your thing is, et cetera. So you can take a look in there. All right, there's a thing with layout. And I don't, I don't think I've ever even used this. The event listeners, the DOM breakpoints, this will become in the, when we talk about JavaScript. All right, but the point is, this is a way that if something is just hinky on your website, you can't figure it out, you might want to go into the inspector. All right. And another way that you can bring it up, rather than just doing a right mouse click and inspect, which always works on any kind of machine, but on Chrome at least, you got your function keys at the top of your screen. If you hit the F12 key, not mine ain't work. Well, I yours should work. Mine probably isn't working because Camtasia that I'm using to tape this, it turns off almost everything that's by default. Yours should work if you hit F12. And if it doesn't, then just right mouse click and choose inspect. All right, but there are other ways too. There's like control key combinations and stuff that you can use as well. All right, so they talk a little bit about that in there and they show you how you can go in. It's what I just showed you, all right? I'd have a read of that if you're interested how to use Chrome's developer tools. All right, I showed you very, very, very short introduction. We will actually look at some of these tools in much more depth and breadth of coverage when we get to the JavaScript part of the class. All right, things that I just rushed through right now. All right, so let's talk about how to work with text, and we'll finish up this chapter then. Okay. <clears throat> so, Different types of fonts. Notice there's serif, sans serif, monospace, cursive, and fantasy. Those are, as it says, the five generic font families. All right. So I, I just want to bring this up. You don't have to. Serif versus sans serif. So one of these has got a really good picture. I guess that maybe was the picture. See the difference? between the way the T's look, whether they got the little stuff on there. All right, that's a serif versus a sans serif font. All right. So the serif has got the decorative stroke sans, which means without, so it doesn't have it. So there are certain fonts that are serif fonts. There are certain other fonts that are sans serif fonts. Now, you can all do this if you want to. Otherwise, just watch. It doesn't really matter. But I'm going to go back to my, where am I in here? I don't need that one up anymore. I'm going to go back to the site that I've been working on here, this real simple little site. And I'm going to go back to my styles here. Now, if I want to set something for the entire page, typically what you put for that tag is the word body. So what I'm going to want to do in here is I'm going to want to set a certain font for the entire page. Are you with me? Now, notice what happens here. Look on the screen if you would. When I type in font family, oops, notice what it gives me. Those are all the built-in ones, and there's even more that aren't showing here. See that? But I'm going to pick one that so you really see the difference. So I'm just going to pick cursive. So I'm going to say font family cursive. I'm going to save it, and I'm going to go back and run this. And you can immediately see a big difference. All right, you say, well, that's not cursive. I didn't make this up. All right. But what I want to show you, just you saw the big difference. That's why I picked that one on purpose. But when I go back here, what I want to show you is this. So I'm going to go back to where we just were. I'm going to remove the cursive, and I'm going to type in here Arial. And you'll notice that's a family. What that means is, oh, I'm going to try to give you an Arial font. If for some reason you don't have an Arial font loaded on your machine, I'm going to try to give you a Helvetica font. If for some reason you don't have that Helvetica font on your machine, I'll give you a sans serif font. And 100% of machines have some kind of a default serif font and some kind of a default sans serif font, all right? But I want to show you one of the different ones. And I'm going to just go down to the second one here. I, it, I don't even know what Franklin Gothic Medium looks like, but I'm choosing it. Why? Because if you've got blanks in your words like this, 
They must be in either single quotes or double quotes. If you really want to, you can take the word Ariel and put it in quotes and sans serif. It doesn't hurt anything. All right. But again, this means give me a Franklin Gothic medium font. If you don't have that, give me an Ariel narrow font. If you don't have that, give me an Ariel font. If you don't have that, give me a sans serif font. So again, if I put that in and I go, it should look markedly different than it did previously. That's all fine and dandy. Not a problem with that. But I'm going to ask you to do something. This is a little ahead, but I think this is a good time to introduce it. That's why I usually do it right here. I'd like all of you to please open up a browser window and go out to fonts.google.com. All right, and we can grab anyone we want in here, but if you look on the screen, I'm gonna grab the Roboto because it's the first one, at least on mine. If you're, for some reason it doesn't show right there, just go into the search fonts and type in Roboto. All right, but I'm just gonna choose that because it's easy. So I'm gonna click here where it says Roboto and notice what it says. Which of these styles do you want? Notice I can get them real dark, etc. And you can choose whatever you want. I'll choose this first one and I'll choose this one down here that says regular 400 and I'll choose the one on the bottom and you'll notice it's starting to build this thing for me right here hopefully it's doing the same thing for you all right so it's telling me which of these things I chose and then it says there's two ways that you can actually bring in a style sheet you can use the link tag which is what we're doing or you can use the import at import tag we're still gonna be using the link. So what I wanna do now is I wanna grab all of the, the code that's in here in this link tag. See that? I wanna grab all that. I'm copying it to the clipboard. I just dragged over it to copy it and I'm doing a control C to copy, okay? Now, this does not go in your CSS. Do you all hear me? This does not go in your CSS. But what I wanna do is I wanna go back to my HTML file. All right, and it doesn't matter if it's above the CSS or below it, but I wanna paste that in. And what I've just told it is, hey, I want access to Google Fonts. It used to only put in one line, now it does a pre-connect in here as well. All right, now I'm almost there, but I'm not there yet. You hear me? I'm almost there, but I'm not there yet. That's good, I'm gonna do a file save, all right, and I'm gonna go back to where I just was in here. Now, this is the CSS rule. See that down here? There's the CSS rule. So I wanna grab, and I want that F in font too. I wanna to grab font family Roboto sans serif. So I'm gonna grab that, I'm gonna copy it. Now I go into the CSS portion and I don't wanna set a font family like that. I don't want that one. I instead want this. So what I've just shown you is how you can bring in a custom font. All right, I'm going to save it. Go take a look. It may or may not look quite a bit different, but that is a Roboto font. Now, as they say, who gives a damn? Well, if you look in here, if I go up to the top, I'm going to go back to the main page here, fonts.google.com, if it'll let me. Come on. There are 1,094 different fonts in here. The pro what you want to do is if you want to make your website stand out, everybody uses Arial. Everybody uses Helvetica, etc. You can go in here and there might be, you know, with 1,094, it's going to take you a while to look through it. But there might be a font that's in here that really would be cool for your site. What I don't recommend is using something like this. Now, there might be a real good reason to use that or to use this lobster, then use it. All right. And it's funny because I created a site over the summer for a woman and I, I you know, I, I showed her this and she's like, you know, I probably only looked through maybe a hundred of them, but so many of them look so similar. I don't know what the heck I wanted. 
all right? Because that's going to take you a while to peruse your way through almost 1,100 of these. Now, with, with some of these, if you go choose them, and I, I'm not saying this will be one, I'm just grabbing this bitter right here. With some of these, when you do it, what it'll show you too, and again, this may or may not, but some of them will say, hey, if you're going to use these, here's another font that goes well with them. Because you might want to use one set of fonts for your headings and another set of fonts for your regular text. All right? Okay. And this is kind of important. So if you take a look in here, notice I showed you the font family. There's font size. All right? And there's more stuff that you can do with fonts as well. All right, it says how to set up other styling properties for fonts. So notice there's font style, normal, italic, and oblique. Oblique really looks like italic. I don't know exactly the difference between oblique and italic. I've never looked it up. The default font style is normal. If you say font weight bold, it's as though you put a B tag or a strong tag on something. All right, you can use font weight bold. You can also use numbers. They have to be whole numbers between 100 and 900 if you want to use those. All right. There's font variant, whether small caps will be used, etc. And there's line height. Now let's take a look at each one of these and do it fairly quickly. All right. So there's font style, italic, normal, etc. There's font variant. There's the weight. The only one I almost ever use is bold. I don't like playing with colors like that because they sometimes don't look the same on all machines. All right, and in all browsers. Line height is a little bit screwy in that line height's are one of the few things in here that most of the time when you use it, you don't put in points or percentages or M's, you just put in 1.4. So that means if normally in line height, basically you use it in paragraphs. It's, so if you've got a multi-line paragraph, it's the space that's between each line in the paragraph. So it's normally one, so 1 1.4 would bump it up. Okay. Now, when you do all this, if you want to set all of them, you can set them individually or you can set them all together. See that? Sometimes when you do some of this stuff, the order matters. Now, they're, they're saying here, if you want to do it all in one, do the style, then the weight, then the variant, then the size, then the family. You don't have to do all of them. You might only want to do two of them, and you can do that. But this is the recommended order for doing them. With a lot of the properties that we're going to be going over, you can combine or you can do them separately. All right. Text indent isn't used a lot. Back when I was you know, a, a little kid, we had to learn to indent our paragraphs. Now it's typically not even done anymore. You just put a blank line between paragraphs. Text the line you use quite a bit. All right. Text the line left, text the line right, text the line center. One thing that you almost never do on a web page, you don't justify content. You know, like you see it sometimes like that in a newspaper. All right. You don't do it because it, it actually makes it harder to read. Plus, it can give, give you some nightmares as far as the amount of white space that you have. All right. Shadows are cool. I mean, that should be pretty self-explanatory right there. Let's, let me grab this one. In fact, I'll just use the one that they've got here. So I'm going to steal it. And I'm going to say text shadow minus two pixels, minus two pixels, four pixels. And these are all as far as where it is, upper, lower, left, right, etc. And then the color, red. All right, so I'm going to grab that. Again, I'm just, I'm just admitted, admitted rather. I'm stealing their stuff from the book here. And I'm going to go back into here. And for our CSS, let's take our, the one custom paragraph that we have. And we'll put that in there. Now that's going to, that might look a little weird. I don't know. Well, we 
should have worked, unless I didn't save it. So custom para, which one is custom para? That is this paragraph right here. All right. It's kind of hard to tell with the coloring. All right, but there is a red outline behind that, a pinkish outline, because it's on black. All right. So if I, you know, just come in here and change the background of this, which we made black. Let's make it like um, 333. That's not that much lighter, is it? Oh, okay, we'll make it white. Forget that. So they should show a lot better. Okay. You can do some, some different effects. You can do some ugly effects with this stuff. I'd call that ugly. All right. You may or may not agree. All right. This is kind of important. This is floating stuff. We're going to actually be getting into this. So notice they've got image here and it says float left. Why does that matter? When you say float left, you're telling it to move it over as far left as you can, but you're telling the text to flow around it. Now, the problem with telling something like this to float left, everything continues to float left until you turn it off. You can float left, you can float right. All right. But what you want to do when you're done floating is you want to clear the floats. So you want to tell it to clear. So what does that mean? Well, you can just clear left. So if you did a float left, the only thing you have to clear is left. If we did a float right, it would look just like this, except the picture would be over here. Does that make sense to everybody? And the text would still be floating around. it. And if we had said float right, then we could clear right. Usually what people do is they just say clear both because that means if any if there are any anything floating it just clears it all right and again we're going to be doing some of this in chapters five and six it says you'll learn how to set margins and float elements but this gives you an idea of how it is used and that's all it's meant to be so that's it for the chapter they show you the html for the site they make now for the first time they're showing you the css so again, if you think, man, I'm falling behind, I'm not getting all this stuff, I'd really say that's a great place to start. And by tomorrow, I got to do it by tomorrow, all right, is I've got to give you all the stuff from the book. So you'll be able to bring it up and play with it if you indeed want to do that. All right, we're going to take a break in just a minute, but right before we do, I'm going to tell you quickly, the next chapter is we are going to t discuss the CSS box model, and I'll put in here W3 schools. So we're going to be talking. You saw the picture of that when we, we did that before, but that's what this chapter is about. Not a super lengthy chapter. All right, I've got 10.03. Let's please come back at 10.15, okay?